Hi, Kinesiology 4120. Welcome to our lecture on periodization. Periodization is the planned variation of modifiable variables to achieve a specific adaptation at a specific time, um, or specific adaptations at specific times throughout the year. So we're planning longer than your individual session, than your individual week of training or your individual month of training. We're looking much further down the road with this, um, this viewpoint on our training or the periodization of our training. What we need to know first about periodization is that beginners adapt to everything. And the key for beginners is to develop a base for future training, a base level of strength, a base level of speed, something like that, in order to further their training in the future, we have to develop a strong wide base for them at the start. And then with successful periodization, this comes from progressive overload um, within the adaptation that we're focused around. So strength, we have to lift continually heavier loads. Speed, we have to move faster incrementally. Um, and that's progressive. This is not instantaneous overload. So we are not um, overloading them by large percentages of what they're doing. Already, we're doing small incremental increases to continually stress the system in order to adapt. So we like to talk about how periodization starts with uh, this image here with Milo. This is Milo and his bull. Um, so Milo had this bull, his calf, um, when he was young. And that calf couldn't walk very well, but he had to get that calf water so he could, it could live um, because the calf was, was his best friend, his, his favorite animal. So he would pick up the calf, walk it up the hill to where the well was and, and give the calf water. Every day he would continually pick up the calf and walk it up to go get its water. And as the calf grew, Milo grew in order to continue to pick up his calf. And as the calf got larger and larger, he became larger and stronger in order to uh, adapt to that stress of picking up his calf. Um, so Milo, initial Milo, was definitely not going to be able to pick up um, the middle-aged calf or the adult calf. Uh, but as he continually, incrementally increased the calf's weight by um, that calf growing larger and larger, um, he was able to then pick up that calf because he had adapted to that stress progressively over time. He didn't try to lift up a full grown calf when he was um, smaller and weaker and younger. As he grew in age, he, he physically grew as well. Um, I'm also going to post up the, the, um, the one of the first published articles on progressive overload um, from 1945. Um, you will have an extra credit opportunity of five points. I'll have that posted up for you, um, but, but look into that. So periodization, modern periodization really started with the Soviet weightlifters and track and field athletes. Um, so there, there's um, articles and, and research done by the Soviets, or now it would be called Russian, um, that talked about how to progressively train their athletes because they, they would take athletes from young, young ages that were, were promising within the sports and continue to progress them for Olympic um, hopefuls. So there's extensive research that they've done on um, weightlifters, so Olympic weightlifters and track and field athletes. And that really kind of sets the foundation for what we know today as the periodization methods that work to develop our athletes. There's also other, uh, there's Bulgarian weightlifter style periodization, which was um, developed by Ivan Abajev. And this is, a, this is a form of maximal training where it's very specific. So these athletes would perform maximal effort clean and jerks, maximal effort snatches, maximal effort squats um, every single day. Um, so they would work up to a max for that day in the snatch. And then they would rest for three, five, six hours, come back to a maximal effort clean and jerk, uh, warm up and, and, and do their training. Their training was clean and jerk and rest and then come back and do their maximal effort squat. Um, and they would do that continually um, until they were progressing over and over, but it was very specific. So there was very little variation within their training and they were working towards progressively increasing the weight that they could lift over time. Um, this works very well if you can recover, but most people could not recover from 
um, working up to a maximum in three movements every single day and nor have the time to perform three training sessions every single day. There's other types of, of periodization too. There's linear periodization, which we'll talk a lot about today. There's undulating, which is one that I use very frequently um, with more advanced athletes. There's conjugate, uh, concurrent training styles, Bulgarian, bodybuilding, split routines, or that's very commonly thought of periodization method, um, but falls into undulating and linear in some cases. But first off, linear periodization is a continual incremental increase in strength over time. Uh, so we are planning to incrementally increase the load that an athlete lifts over time until they can no longer uh, continue with that, that same movement pattern or they, that they're maximized their base level of strength. Linear progression is fantastic for beginning athletes. So you start them off with Okay, now first day you, you squat the barbell, next training session, maybe a, later on that week, you squat the barbell with, with 10 more pounds on it. Next training session, uh, 15 pounds, the next 20, 30, 40, until that athlete can no longer achieve that movement, back off and continue to progress until they are uh, maximized through that progression. This is fantastic for beginners, it works. I have athletes using a, a linear progression right now. They're beginners and they're, they're already much stronger than they thought they were and that they could have been if they really started off with trying to push as much as they could right away. That will really cause a stall and we're not going to develop the movement pattern as well as the strength uh, unless we use really that linear progression over time. Then after you really maximize the linear progression, it's great to move into something called an undulating periodization method where we alternate and, and manipulate volume and intensity over time to maximize something like strength, power, hypertrophy. It's still a linear model. However, how we achieve this linear model of progression is done differently. So instead of incrementally adding more and more weight for the same repetitions for the same movement over time, we're now using maybe it's high volume, low intensity, and then we shift it into higher intensity, low volume to build strength. Then we build some hypertrophy with that strength with a, with a lower volume or a higher volume, lower intensity. And we flip flop between a uh, more intensity focused cycle or, or a couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and a very volume focused cycle. And we alternate the two over time to progress into maximal strength where, where intensity is the highest and volume is the lowest. Um, so this is a great method for um, more advanced athletes, ones that have really completed a linear progression um, and maximized their foundation. Now you can start to use more advanced methods like undulating periodization, and you can do this for long periods of time um, with the ability to optimize recovery by manipulating the recovery curve through volume and intensity. Um, some of you may have heard of conjugate weightlifting systems or conjugate, uh, the conjugate system coined by Westside Barbell. Uh, they use constantly varied methods uh, in order to cause progressed adaptation through variation and using maximal efforts and using dynamic efforts or very high speed efforts and alternating the two. So it's kind of a high low model with the upper extremity and then a high-low model with the lower extremity. This is a very, um, this, this style works and it works very well in elite power lifters. So power lifters who have already gone through a linear progression, they've already gotten stronger often using some kind of um, undulating method and now they're, they're working towards that highest level elite. This is not a system that you're going to implement with your beginners or your intermediate athletes. And it often works best for power lifters because that's what it's designed for. Um, there are coaches who can use it for other sports, but it takes time and training within that system to really be able to um, place it into a more sporting context because most athletes don't have the foundation of movement in order to really maximize the effectiveness of the conjugate system. Um, then we have other styles like concurrent training. This is what you're going to see most often is a, co a concurrent training model with 
an undulating um, system um, or a linear system, most often an undulating system with concurrent methods. So you'll have strength methods, you'll have maybe endurance methods, and you'll have high speed methods. And you'll change them around throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year in order to maximize multiple adaptations to some extent. An individual who is following a concurrent training model will never maximize strength, maximize speed, and maximize endurance. Okay, they will not maximize all, but they can develop all of them. So most sports develop or need a level of strength, a level of speed, and a level of endurance to compete within that sport. If we can optimize each of these, so build as much strength as required, build as much speed as required, as much conditioning as required, we can help to improve the physiological abilities for that athlete for their sport because their sport is probably not just sprinting, just swimming endurance, or just lifting weights. It's probably soccer, football, basketball, baseball, a sport that requires all of these components to an extent, and we have to use a concurrent training model to optimize each of them. Um, with the Bulgarian method, this is using a, a daily max of a, a snatch, a clean and jerk, and a front squat. It is extremely specific. So this follows the SEDS principle to a T, specific adaptation to imposed demands. These are the specific adaptations for the impose or for the environment, which is Olympic weightlifting, which consists of maximal snatch and maximal clean and jerk. So we develop each of them by performing daily maximums of each of those activities. It's very specific, but an individual who's a beginner, this is not going to be fantastic because their daily max is going to change every single day and it's going to be drastically different because their technique and their movement skill has not been developed their base level of strength has not been developed. This is a very specific system for a very specific group. Um, so you can't just try a method without often performing the requisite um, prior training. So think of linear progression as your starter, your beginner, and then you move into an undulating periodization model later and then you can use maybe a Bulgarian or a conjugate if you have a very specific group of, pe of people that you're trying to train. Um, but you'll often use a concurrent model with a linear or undulating progression for your athletes. The last one most people um, in the United States often think of when they think of training is we have to do a split routine. We have to do um, back and buys on one day, chest and tries on another day, and legs on another day or we're doing push on this day, pull on this day, um, squat on this day, hinge on this day, uh, and it's very specific to body parts or movement patterns and splitting them up. Um, this works for developing musculature very well. So hypertrophy, this is a great method for hypertrophy, and you'll use maybe a linear method or an undulating model or periodization underneath a orientation of a bodybuilding split routine. Um, this is not optimal for most sport performance because sport in most cases is not physique driven or hypertrophy driven. It is skill driven within that sport. Um, so we want to look more at how we order our exercises and organize our exercises to develop the what the athlete needs for their sport and then use a periodization model to give them a long term look or long-term progression into their development. So how do we do this with team sports? They, what we'll talk about first is, is really traditional block periodization. This is a mix of both linear and undulating periodization methods. Um, so we use, think of it as a linear adaptation with an undulating volume and intensity throughout um, the training. So maybe week one is, is low volume, high intensity, and then we have moderate, and then we have highest volume, and then we go back to lower volume. Um, and we, we, mod, or we, we modify them throughout um, the month. So it undulates throughout that month. 
um, and we're trying to have a linear adaptation of maybe strength or, or conditioning or speed or whatever we're trying to develop. There are pros and cons to this um, because realistically within each block you are focused on one adaptation. Okay, one adaptation at a time. So say block one, you're focused on hypertrophy. Block two, you're focused on functional hypertrophy. So kind of mixing um, hypertrophy with strength and kind of combining the two. And then the next you go strictly after, after strength. After, um, and then you look at, and then you go into power and then you go into speed. But by the time you've gotten to speed, you're already six months away from when you last did a hypertrophy style training and you've maybe lost muscle mass through the progression of decreasing volume over time. So now your athlete is maybe not as large as they were at the start. Um, so there are pros and cons with traditional block periodization because it does have a linear progression throughout the adaptation, but it does leave adaptations on the table towards the end, depending on, on what you're really looking for. So what block periodization is really trying to do is to build during the off season, build specifically in the preseason, have a maintenance or a realization phase in the in season. So we're trying to really maximize those adaptations in season. And then we have a recovery off season. This is the curve of sport performance. We're trying to have maximum sports performance within the in season phase of training. Okay, we don't want to be at our best during the off season because that gives us no benefit for the actual competition that occurs in season. And we can only be at our best for a certain period of time. We can't always be at our best. Okay, we have to undulate and we have to um, wave this throughout the year in order to optimize our in season performance. So let's break down how to do this and, and break down the key terms that fall into periodization. The first term is macro cycle. So this is one full year of training or full training cycle. This could be one year, this could be three months, it could be six months, it could be um, two years, it could be four years, depending on the length of the training cycle. A block is a piece of the cycle with a specific purpose. So the block is a smaller piece of the macro cycle. So that block may be a hypertrophy block of training. So it's a piece of the training that is focused around a specific goal of maybe hypertrophy or strength or speed or power. The mesocycle is a specific adaptation phase with it that aligns with that goal of the block. So if the goal of the block is maximal strength, you may have a mesocycle that is functional hypertrophy. So it's heavier and high volume. It may be um, strength, and then we're looking at maximal strength. So strength and then higher percentage strength. So 85% and then 95%, something like that. So we're more specific, that, but it still aligns with the goal of the block. So at the end of the block, we should achieve that very specific adaptation that is the purpose of that individual block. A mesocycle is a piece of those blocks. A microcycle is the smaller piece or the or the individual cycle within the mesocycle. So it's usually one to two weeks. A mesocycle is normally somewhere between two to six weeks. Um, and it repeats microcycles one, two, three, four, five, six times. Um, so we repeat microcycles within the mesocycle. We have separate mesocycles within the block. We have separate blocks within the macro cycle. And then finally at the smallest piece, we have the session, which is the individual training session. You can have multiples within a day, but it's one session. That one session should align with the goal of the microcycle. And the goal of the microcycle should align with, the, align with the goal of the mesocycle, which aligns with the block, which aligns with the macro cycle. They do not have to be the same. They just have to align on the progression that is set out within your macro cycle, your block progression, your mesocycle progressions within the blocks then your microcycles within the mesocycle that you repeat a certain amount of times in order to fit the adaptation of the mesocycle. And then the session is going to align with the goal of the microcycle. Um, so I know that might seem confusing, but I'm going to give you a little visuals to help with this. So with our, our macrocycle, our goal is to achieve peak performance 
at maybe it's the end of the season, the end of a year, the, the end of a four-year Olympic cycle, um, whatever your end goal is, that is going to be the end of your macro cycle, the end of, of postseason, whatever it is. And then we are going to backtrack from that micro or that that end point to our start point, and we're going to fill in the blanks along the way in order to achieve what we actually want. And we know that our adaptations layer on each other to develop each other. So um, having a higher level of aerobic capacity builds your ability to recover, which means you can do uh, a higher training frequency. You have a higher training frequency. You can train more throughout that time period at a higher intensity and still recover and so on and so on to develop your final adaptation, whatever it is. Okay, so here is our systematic approach to whole program design. So we know that our goal is this end location, this end adaptation, and we're going to work our way back. First, we have to look at what type of progression or periodization style or approach we're going to use. Is it going to be linear, undulating, conjugate, concurrent? What is it? Then we have to look at what's our training frequency. How often are we training at each time point throughout the training cycle? In season is going to train less than off season, which is going to train slightly. Off season might train more than preseason. It just depends on the training style. You train depends on your athletes where they're training. Um, so decide your training frequency. Choose your exercise choice or your exercise menu, okay, which we, we know that our exercise menu was, is what we're going to use based on the equipment we have, where we have our training, and we know that our choices choose our location of adaptation. So if our goal is, if we're trying to develop lower body strength at the end of this macro cycle, we know that we have to use exercise choices that train the musculature of the lower body. Um, we have to look at our order, our intensity, our volume, and our rest. These last three through seven, we have to choose those for every single session, and we have to make sure that they fit. So we will work through each of them, and we'll work through them throughout the entire cycle in order to achieve that final goal. Some other key terms we have to understand are supercompensation, which is the increase inability above initial levels. Um, and this is only felt after a restoration period following training. Fatigue masks fitness. So if we have a fatigued athlete or a very uh, a hard, hard trained athlete, they've been training for a while, uh, they haven't had a long period of recovery, they're not going to be performing at their maximum because fatigue has pushed them down. If you allow for a time period for recovery, so a taper period where you uh, minimize volume, either through through frequency or through sets or repetitions, however you, you allow them to rest, you can then allow them to express their new level of adaptation or their new level of fitness. Peaking is planned supercompensation at a specific time or maximizing an athlete's ability through recovery post heavy training. Um, and then, so, so that's what we're trying to do with, with very specific sports. Uh, most often meat based sports where you're trying to, where you have a specific competition at a specific time, not ones that have games throughout a season. So like baseball, professional baseball has 162 games in a season. You are not able to peak 162 times and you don't want to be a very low fitness at the start and then high fitness at the end because you still have to perform well enough to get to the postseason. So sports like that, you won't see an often a, a peaking strategy. Um, and we want to minimize overtraining, which is a, um, a combination of fatigue um, and poor performance and often um, injury, illness, um, changes in hormone profiles because of a lack of recovery. So we're trying to cause a stress that is that is kind of a an overreaching overreaching is um, pushing beyond current capacities in order to stimulate supercompensation but we can't push to the point of overtraining where we cause a poor performance so there's there's this fine line between 
overreaching our athletes and overtraining. Uh, being able to overreach just enough and then taper to super compensate is an art that happens through, through repeated training and, and learning how to organize these variables with our athletes and what works best for those athletes. Um, because this really follows this principle of general adaptation syndrome, where we have our training session that depletes our ability. We try to recover and we, we give time for a restitution or recovery period post-training to a point where we super compensate or we become better than we were before. This is a model. Um, this doesn't happen every single time. So I do one training session doesn't mean that I'm automatically super compensating. <laughs> because that workout has to, or that training session has to be enough in order to cause an adaptation. And the recovery period has to be long enough to allow for the adaptation to be achieved and to express above. You can't have this next training session in the middle because it's going to drop your recovery even further. Planning the amount where you can, you can manipulate your recovery curve with your super compensation is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that this super compensation is much higher than our initial level at the time that we need it. We do that through tapering or timing training variations to super compensate at a very specific time. We often do this most frequently for things like track and field, swimming, strength sports, um, and combat sports. You're going to see very effective taper, or you're going to see tapering with your training. The keys to an effective taper are timing a 50% drop in total volume by competition time. We can't drop it to zero because then our athlete is going to, um, it's going to change how they are working. If you've ever taken a week off of training, when you come back to competition or you come back to work, it's much more difficult than it was before. So we want to minimize volume without changing frequency. So if our athlete trains five days a week, we just have to cut the total volume by 50%, but we need them to maintain a frequency of training of five days a week. Um, it's for a, a, it's a psychological benefit. So we're, we're used to that routine and it's going to keep us moving and ready, um, but it's going to allow the body to recover. Um, intensity should decrease a little bit in the last two weeks to 10 days from competition but the focus should be more on recovery. So we can still push intensity a little bit. We can't minimize intensity. If we take away intensity, we're not going to stimulate high threshold motor unit recruitment and high speed of movement, which is going to limit us in competition if we go away from that too long, because we know that it takes about a week for a speed adaptation to really fall off. So we have to be continually stimulating that speed adaptation. Um, so focus on recovery, focus on technique, focus on skill acquisition, and don't lose training frequency as a way to cut volume, but you still need to cut down on volume. Okay, out of those, now let's get into building our training. So first we have to look at our calendar. We're going to build our training plan. We look at our calendar, we've got January through December. All right, I'm working um, with my college group, um, a group of college athletes at a, at a university, and I'm, I'm looking at a spring sport. So first off, I have to look at my calendar. When can I train them? So first I'll look for holidays because I know I can't train them on holidays. So I've got a holiday here, a holiday there. Uh, I have a, a spring break, I have a, a fall break. I have specific ones during the, the year. Okay, so I can't train on these days. I also have to look at my vacation period. So I'm, I'm looking at working with college athletes. So I know that they, they can't train for certain months within maybe the winter time and the summertime. I gotta find final exams uh, because I know that my athletes are gonna be super stressed on final exams and they can't be training at, at super high intensities, high volumes while they're having all these other stressors. Okay, I'm gonna look at my schedule for all my games. I've got a spring sport with March, April, and May of competition, and then, then I have to look at maybe some postseason. 
where the, the major competitions are that really matter. Okay. So now I'm looking at all of this and I'm saying, okay, which days can I actually train? I can't train on any game days. I can't train on holidays. The athletes can't be mandated to train during vacation periods. So that leaves me with one month, half a month, half a month, half a month, no month, no month almost a whole month, two whole months, almost three, almost and then like a, a half a month. So how am I going to get anything done? Okay, this is where we have to really start thinking within our training of, of how we can optimize every single session to get the most out of our athletes because we don't have a lot of time. There's only so much time to train. We also have to look at thinking about their practice schedule. We have to think about when really hard practices are, when light practices are, when – how often they can train because of NCA regulations. Okay, there's, there's millions of different pieces to think of. And we haven't even planned a single training session. This is going to be tough. All right. Well, let's start. So I'm going to develop my, my best case scenario macro cycle. And then I can always modify if I have to, because there's always going to be changes what you write out as your first program is not going to be the program that is completely followed. There will always be modifications because athletes are hurt. Okay. There may be competitions. Maybe the, the coach wants to change something. There's always going to be differences. Okay? Maybe there's a time period where they can't train. Okay? Maybe you have something like, like COVID where you can't train at all and you have to train or you have to change absolutely everything. Create your best case scenario and you can always work off of that. Okay, with my best case scenario, I'm going to plan this as a four, four block block training cycle uh, or a full macro cycle, four blocks. Each block is going to be three months. Um, this is a general example. You don't have to follow this. This is a general example. Okay, so each block is going to have a specific adaptation, a very specific goal, and each block will build on the next so that they can maximize adaptation at the end. First block is going to be hypertrophy for me. So furthest away from in season, let's say for this, for this example, theoretically, my competition is uh, New Year's Day. Let's say it's New Year's Day for the following year at the very end. So I want to maximize it at the very end. I'm, I'm doing a, a New Year's Day competition. Block one is going to be hypertrophy. It's going to be the furthest away from my final, which my competition is, say, it's a 100-meter race. I'm doing a 100-meter race. And I need to be at my best by on January 1st. Block one will be hypertrophy. I'm going to build up as much muscle mass as I can at the start because I know that speed and hypertrophy are not going to be always one and one. Okay? Just because I have large muscles does not mean that I, they can contract quickly. But if I don't have a lot of muscle mass, it's going to limit my force production. So I'm going to build hypertrophy first. <laughs> Block two, I'm going to build strength because now that I have all of this muscle mass, I need to learn how to use it and use it to produce high amounts of force. So I'll do block two, I'll, I'll develop strength. Block three, I'll develop power because having high force production is great, but if I can't produce force quickly and do it at high velocities, I am useless in my sport of 100 meter sprinting. So I'm going to focus a lot about power. So I'm, I'm going to use that newfound strength and use it explosively. Finally, I'm going to transition into speed. And my final block, I'm going to maximize speed because now I can produce a lot of force. I can produce it quickly. And now I have to maximize my speed of movement. And I know speed is the adaptation that goes away the fastest. I will lose speed the fastest. I will lose power the second fastest and strength the third fastest. So speed is going to be developed last and it's going to come from my foundation of strength and power, I'm going to be able to maximize my speed. All right, so let's look at this specific block. So block one is hypertrophy. I'll, I'll sequence it because I know that I can't do, I can't just jump into super high volume, heavy training for hypertrophy. I'm going to go with small hypertrophy, moderate hypertrophy, uh, big hypertrophy. Um, so I'm going to progress, progressive overload, progression, I'm going to progress my hypertrophy throughout the three week or the three months so I can maximize hypertrophy at the very end. Okay. That will be my super hypertrophy 
mesocycle. This will be my intro to hypertrophy, my continued hypertrophy, and my maximizing hypertrophy. Now in block one, I'm going to use say hypertrophy and muscular endurance to really progress myself, get myself into it, add a base of, of, of endurance foundation for my training. Block two, I'll focus on hypertrophy, uh, really working in that, that kind of high volume, very moderate intensity because I'm really just starting out, I'm progressing the intensity, building up my volume, trying to maximize my muscle mass, and then I'll move into, say, a functional hypertrophy block where I'm working on um, heavy but still super high volume to really stimulate hypertrophy through mechanical tension um, and metabolic damage. Um, so I'm really focusing on, on maximizing my hypertrophy with heavier loads, which is, which is what's done during functional hypertrophy style training. Go back to our, peer design, or our program design lectures to look at where that range is. Okay, so... Now I'm going to look at that cycle. I, I have four weeks within this mesocycle. Uh, now I have to look down to microcycle, say four. So give me an example of microcycle four, 25th to the 31st. They're arbitrary dates. Um, I just gave us kind of the ending. So this is microcycle four of my functional hypertrophy meso or micro or mesocycle, sorry, mesocycle of my hypertrophy block of my overall speed macrocycle. So just because I'm developing speed doesn't mean I have to only train speed throughout the entire year. There's no way that just doing speed training through the whole year is going to maximize speed. I have to develop other qualities that can benefit my overall goal quality. Okay, so this is my microcycle, my one week of training. Focus is functional hypertrophy and it's microcycle four. If you think back to how we do our block periodization. It's increase on week one to two to three, and then we back off on week four for recovery, and then we go into the next one, okay, into the next mesocycle. So because this is mesocycle four, or microcycle four within our mesocycle three, I'm going to have to back off on my volume. So session one, session two, session three, my three-day week frequency, because I'm really just starting out. Um, it's, it's month three. I'm going to have a functional hypertrophy session on each day. My focus is speed for my 100 meter sprint. So I'm going to use two lower extremity days. I'm going to have one upper extremity focus day because um, I know that I can't handle three lower extremity heavy days without, for, without losing recovery. Um, so I'll add in that upper body functional hypertrophy day um, so I can look good in my jersey when I'm racing and, and to really add another stimulus day without causing a, a lack of recovery in the lower extremities. All right, so here's my individual three sessions. So I have my back squat focus on session one, my bench press focus on session two, my deadlift focus on session three. My secondary exercises all fall into this functional hypertrophy zone, which is around six to 12 repetitions. And on average, it's around eight. My intensity is still high, but I have three sets instead of maybe in, in week three, the, the session before I had maybe five sets of eight. And I was really pushing the volume and now I'm backing off to three. Okay? If we look at individual sessions on their own, does this session of session two, a bench press, bent row, an overhead press, tricep extensions, and bicep curls. Uh, three by eight, three by eight, three by eight, three by 15, three by 15 are major exercise at 74% one RM. Does this look like a training session done when the overall goal is maximum speed in a 100 meter sprint? No, but without the context of our entire macro cycle, we cannot judge individual sessions. This individual session fits absolutely perfectly into a functional hypertrophy mesocycle of a hypertrophy block of training to develop capacities for nine months down the road. So we have to think about these in very long-term goals. We can't just look at each individual session and say, oh no, bench press doesn't make me faster. I can't do a bench press. 
training bench press at high intensities adds to nervous system drive. And if we can practice having higher nervous system drive under metabolic fatigue, that's going to benefit me later on in my training. So it's all about progression over time. Do not think about one exercise in particular compared to the other. Think about it on the long term and how each session and each microcycle adds onto the next and each mesocycle adds onto the next and each block adds to the next so that you can achieve that adaptation at the end. So backtrack a little bit, we'll break it down. Block one, mesocycle three, microcycle four, session two. Okay. This is one very small piece of a very large cycle. Okay. So it's a very small individual piece. And as we continue throughout this cycle, each block adds to the next, each individual mesocycle adds to the next, each microcycle adds to the next in progression and in volume intensity. This is a long process. Okay? It's not a overnight change. It is a over months and months and years and years change to optimize performance at a very specific time period. Um, if we're thinking specifically for like Olympic sports, athletes who are in their third Olympics have been training for the Olympics for over 12 years. That's a lot of individual training sessions. And over that time, you have manipulated volume and intensity in order to peak during competition time. <laughs> so in preparation, phase one, say block one, like our blocks earlier, Block one and block two are preparation. They're very high volume. They're very, or they're moderately low intensity. During maybe block three, we're in transition. The volume's dropped down, but the intensity is bumped right up when it comes to intensity of speed. And competition phase, we are in full blown speed. Our volume is very low. Our intensity is very, very high. It's very technically focused so that we can optimize performance and then you can recover after. So, how can we vary volume and intensity for these blocks in particular? For block one, our hypertrophy block, it's going to be very high volume, moderate intensity. So the intensity is not going to be super large. It's not going to be very, very heavy, but the volume is going to be extremely high. This is a sum of all volume and intensity for the entire block. So not individual sessions over the entire block. Give the caveat there. For strength, the volume is going to be moderate, maybe moderate to low, but the intensity is going to be extremely high as a percentage of one repetition maximum. That's our goal. We are going to push that as high as possible. For our power, our volume is going to drop dramatically, but our intensity is going to stay moderate so we can develop power. This is intensity as a percentage of one repetition maximum. So, we are trying to push velocity now by limiting the intensity and maximizing the velocity of movement. So intensity cannot be high if we want to move fast. And then lastly, in speed, our volume is very, very low. Our intensity is very low so we can maximize speed because speed cannot be maximized at moderate or high intensities as a percentage of one repetition maximum. But as we lower the intensity, we can maximize the velocity. If we have high volume, we cannot maximize velocity. If we have high intensity, we can't maximize velocity. And velocity is what matters in block four because the goal is speed. So see this long progression? These individual sessions will not maximize speed, but they will give me the foundation for strength, which will give me the foundation for power so give me the foundation for speed so I can realize speed when it matters. So it's all about progression over time. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll talk more about this in lab. If you have questions, please reach out. Um, I'm happy to help. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week.